Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to this talk. We are going to, to talk about uh, Sixlopan, Sixlopan networks, and more precisely how to, to do penetration testing on that type of networks. Uh, as you are going to, to understand, uh, the hard part is not to do the actual penetration tests, but to reach the, 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 to the point where you are able to do the tests. So, uh, a little bit of context. Uh, we are both uh, security auditors from uh, Airbus Defense and Space. We are working internally to do security audit and penetration testing uh, within the, the Airbus group. But uh, we also uh, work with uh, other companies to help them improve their, their security. So, uh, there's a picture of the one particular audit that will be the, the, the actual subject of this talk. Uh, that was um, um, water monitoring systems, and uh, we did penetration testing on it. And we are going to to, to present to you the, the methodology, the tool we developed to do the test. We actually also are releasing the tool uh, here, and uh, we are also going to give you the, the results of this uh, penetration test. So, um, this network was relying on the Sixlopan protocol. So, what is the Sixlopan protocol? Basically, it is IPv6 uh, stretched and compressed and torn apart in order to make it uh, fit uh, over the air, to have less, uh, um, a lesser network footprint. Think here we are talking about smart grid. Uh, that means we, are, we want to have low energy uh, infrastructure, low, uh, low energy protocol. IPv6 is uh, anything but low energy. Uh, just one uh, address is 128 bytes. You have two addresses, a source address and a destination address. Uh, this is a lot of information compared to the, the information that will be broadcasted by uh, metering infrastructure. Think sensor that broadcast the, their information. So how the six slopan network uh, actually do the do the, the compressing? That's quite uh, quite simple. Uh, they have the, um, a six slopan header on top of the uh, the IPv6 header with a lot of flags, and these flags uh, just basically tell you how to decompress the, the IPv6 header. Uh, for example, uh, you have a flag to say that the first 64 bytes of the uh, IP address is the, the bytes from the MAC address. Uh, in fact, it's the EID address, but that's the equivalent, that's the MAC address. And so on. You have plenty of flags. You have flags, for example, for the TTL with predefined value. You cannot set the TTL precisely. You only have a few uh, predefined values to choose, to choose from. You can also uh, use flag to say that you are omitting uh, a complete field because you do not need that field. You can also use context. Context are pre-shared information and you have indexes. And so you just provide uh, the index of the pre-shared information and uh, the device will just fill the blanks with this pre-shared information. Usually, uh, with, we, it's uh, in the context of uh, metering infrastructure, you are broadcasting information. And uh, if you miss one information, that's not critical. You have more information coming constantly. So you don't need to be sure that you get all the information. So you don't need a connected protocol, meaning I mean you don't need TCP. So usually we find UDP on top of Sixlopan. That's why the Sixlopan uh, standard also specify how to compress the UDP header, pretty much like it does with the, the, the IPv6 header. Keep in mind also that uh, you have uh, uh, a, a short uh, maximum transmission unit, only 127 bytes compared to the 1,500 bytes. So the Sixlopan uh, protocol also specifies how to fragment and defragment IPv6 packets to, to Sixlopan packets. So what's the big deal? Uh, you, you know IPv6 is part of, it's an IP protocol. There are already a lot of tools to interact with IPv6. Usually when you do penetration testing, you do not directly uh, target the IPv stack. You more 
usually you are more about uh, the targeting the higher layer protocol, TCP, HTTP. So again, there's nothing new here. You can just use the existing tool, the existing methodology. So why not just uh, why not just use an USB adapter, just like you would do with Wi-Fi? Just buy a six open USB adapter, plug into your computer, and uh, start uh, doing the plantation test. Well, that would be too easy. The uh, under layer, under the, the six open protocol, okay, so I mean the, the physical layer and the Mac uh, sub layer, is uh, handled by the 15.4 protocol. And this is where things get complicated. You have really a lot of possible configuration with 15.4. For example, you can set up the uh, network topology as a mesh network, when every end device can communicate with each other, or as a star network, where end device must only uh, send information to coordinators. But how to send this information? Well, you have also two types of, uh, of transmission. You have the direct transmission, when one node will just send the information. You have the indirect transmission, when the node who is going to first say that he has information pending and wait for the receiving node to say, OK, you can send the information. You can use GTSs, guaranteeing time slot. It's, uh, it's a system to allow uh, time slot to, eat, uh, to each device to make sure that there's no collision. This is something that is optional. You not, uh, do not uh, need necessarily to use GTSs. And you can use beacons. Beacons in 6 open networks, I mean in um, 15.4 networks, not only uh, are beaconing the, the network, but they also can uh, host a lot of information if you want to. So you can see here that you, if you combine multiple choice, you can have really several possible configurations. But that's not all. You also have to think about security. Encryption security is provided by the Mac layer. And there again, you have multiple choices. You can only protect integrity, you can only protect confidentiality, or you can protect both. You can choose a different type of key, I mean size of key, 32, 64, or 128. So again, more source, more choice, so more possibilities if you make more combination with the previous uh, possibilities I've exposed. And of course, you have multiple revisions of the standards. You have the 2003 standard, that, uh, which specifies a type of encryption, which is incompatible with the encryption specified by the 2006 standard. And the 2006 standard, is uh, using the same encryption as the 2011, but they, the key management system is a little bit different. So, again, more combinations are possible. At that point, you should see that in order to connect, to use the, six, uh, the IPv6 tool, so to connect to six local networks, you must first understand all the, the, the precisely the configuration of the underlying 15.4 infrastructure. And this is really the, the hard part, because you have to guess, you have to brute force. If you're working with uh, the um, a customer that asks you to do the penetration test, you can ask for the information, but usually it does not have the information. He relies on the supplier to do the, the infrastructure. And if you ask the supplier, he might say that this is intellectual property. He does not want to share this information with you. You might want to um, directly get the information yourself by taking apart a sensor, for example. But if the sensor is uh, embedded in a water pipe, that's quite difficult. Just to, to illustrate this, here are the list of uh, possible encryption uh, options on the 2003 standards. Here from the 2006, so you can see they are different. But one additional difficulty is that in the 2006 version of the, the frame format, you have three bytes, three bits, sorry, three bits, to specify the encryption you used. But that is not the case with the 2003 uh, version of the standard. You have to know beforehand to guess the version of the, the choice you, you made for encryption. And of course, that is not all. Usually, when a supplier is building uh, an infrastructure, 15.4 or something else, 
it will be, he, the, this supplier will be the one to build everything, the sensors, the coordinators, the border routers that connect the smart grid to the IT infrastructure. That means that if the, the supplier makes a mistake while implementing the, the norm, usually this mistake will stay unnoticed for long. By that I mean that if the mistake does not induce failure or performance losses, since every component of the network has this uh, deviation from the standard, no one really will notice it for long. We have one good example of this. Uh, well, actually, we have many, but this one, we can publicly talk about it because the, the component is freely, publicly available to, to anyone. That is the XB S1 uh, chip from uh, DG, who is using the 2003 version of the frame format, but the 2006 security suites for encryption. This chip has been around since 2010-2009, and uh, nowhere on the internet we could find mention of this. And actually, we, we, we did get to talk with a DG engineer, and they, they realized the, this, this deviation with, by talking to us. So really, when I say that they can stay unnoticed and it's quite easy to encounter them when you're doing audit, that's really true. That is why we started the, the Arsen project that stands for advanced routing between six Lopan and Ethernet networks. And the very idea of this project was to build two distinct tools. The first one was about a scanner that could detect every possible uh, option from a, a 15.4 network, including deviations. And then from all this information, uh, this information would be provided to another tool, a border router, that would be able to translate IPv6 uh, datagram to six low-point frames and vice versa while using all the information provided by the scanner. This tool is based on another tool we, we are, we've released two years ago, that is SCAPI Radio, which basically is uh, SCAPI, a uh, famous and very powerful uh, packet manipulator. Combined with uh, GNU Radio, a software defined radio framework that allows us to work with any kind of radio communication protocol. So, I said we have two main components in this project. The first one is very simple. I mean, it's the way it works. It simply builds a database of all devices that you can see by analyzing what SCAPI radio is sniffing on the 15.4 network and analyze this information to infer everything you can, actually. Which devices are running on which channel, which devices are communicating with, communicating with each other, what type of frame they are communicating, what are the parameters, and by that I mean also encryption parameters, that are used to transmit these frames. On the other end, the six lopan border router, using this information from the scanner, create a, a tune interface, so it's not a tap interface, so actually we don't need Ethernet anymore. And basically it's a Skype automaton that will translate every datagram received on the tune interface into one or multiple six open frames and translate while defragmenting any six open frames to an APV6 frame and send it to the tune interface. We had to modify Scapi Radio actually to, to achieve this. Uh, first, there, there were existing 15.4 layers and six, and six open layers. As for the 15.4 layers, we fixed several bugs, but we also uh, imp uh, implemented both 2003 and 2006 version, uh, encryption methods. And we'll see later, we also implemented encryption not based on a key, an encryption key, but based on key stream provided by the user. This is related to a cryptographic attack that Arno is going to, to present uh, in, a few, in a few slides. As for the six lopan, basically we implemented everything, mostly we, everything from the, the norm. Uh, it's almost re re rewriting from scratch. Uh, as far as we, we know from our test, everything is implemented except for the indexes. Like I said, uh, it's possible to work with context, 
the six open frame will provide indexes to know which context to, to pull out when the end device receives the frame. There's no way to know this, con this context over the air, so this is not something we have implemented so far, but apart from that, every everything else has been uh, implemented. So now let's talk about uh, security attacks. So we will not focus on attacks on availability because since we are talking about wireless, you can simply use a jammer and do a denial of service. So there is no big point to find another way to attack availability because it's a simple route. We will mostly focus on confidentiality and integrity. And since we are talking about a sensor for water management, for example, the critical point is integrity because, in fact, confidentiality is not that much important at this level. But still. So for confidentiality, we'll uh, talk about semblance attacks. And for integrity, we'll talk about replay attacks and malleability attacks. So a few words on IES and CTR mode. So as Jonathan showed you, it's one of the modes used for encryption um, and the most interesting one, we think. And what we will say, I will say is also true for CCM, so uh, uh, encryption and authentication. So why CTR mode? It's because if we use IES in, C in CBC mode, it will we do a block encryption, and since we are using short packets, I mean shorter than the size of the IRS block output, we will have to do a lot of padding, and transmitting padding over the air is the worst of efficiency and energy. So we use stream encryption, which is CTR mode. So one main point of stream encryption is we are using the K stream, which is the output of the block ciphering, uh, and we XOR it with the plain text to have the cipher text. One main concern with that, if, if we have um, several packets with the same query stream, we can do some crypto analysis. So each packet should have a different uh, nonce, a different case stream, and if we see, it's meant to uh, a different nonce. Since the counter is a RS counter, so it's predictable, and the K is of course constant. So, the nonce is a value that will change between packets and avoid to, uh, the possibility to do some crypto analysis with the loft of packets with the same case stream. So now the nonce on 15.4 is based on the source ext ID, so it's something we can find, and frame counter. So in order to do our attack, we will need you know, the same nonce attacks so basically having a large number of frames with the same case stream and so the same nonce that will allow us to do our uh, crypto analysis. So the replay attack is something really basic. We, you resend the packet that you have recorded, but you need to send it with uh, the good counter value because you have a frame counter. And the malleability attack is basically the, the, the two precedent together, so we need to know a case stream to create, for, to craft our packet, and we need to know the value of the frame counter. Okay, so now time to do some pen tests. So we know how security works, we have the tools that Jonathan introduced, and we have some guess on how we can attack it. So this is a wireless network uh, used in water distribution, so we are working on it. And Obviously, the first step of the pen test is like an IT pen test. We try to find as much information as possible. So we scan all channels of 15.4, uh, um, and we find that there is communication on channel 18, that each sensor is communicate only with the PAN coordinator, which makes sense because if we have sensors, they are only broadcasting information. So it's a start topology, and the PAN is only transmitting beacon frame. So we can also sh see on the um, screen, it's a capture of the tools on the right side. Uh, we can see that the frame version is a 2006 standard the, and security is used in CTR mode. And we have also the short address of the pan and the sensor. But we will need the long address. As we have seen, it's used for the nodes. So we need the long address. So 
we know that the long address is the extended or long address, the same, is transmitting when the sensor is associating with the pan. So basically, we need to force a new association. This is something you can find on a lot of attacks on wireless network. So <coughs> how to do that? So we try to flout the sensor, so send a lot of frame and random frame to the sensor. So the sensor cannot track the pan the beacon frame from the pan because the channel is full. And since the, the sensor is not receiving any more be any beacon frame, it will lose its synchronization. And if we stop flooding, it will resynchronize and so send its extended address. So we got it. The next step, and the simplest one, we want to add our fake sensor to the network. So basically, there is no secure function to during the association process. We do not find any higher layer authentication system, and there is no filter on the address. You can, we can use an address as we want. So it's basically straightforward. But we are, seen, we are able to connect our sensor, but we are not able to send frame, because we cannot encrypt frame. We, we, do, know, we do not know the key. So uh, as we see previously, our, our main goal is to, um, to manage this frame counter, so to predict its value. So the simplest way is to reset it, so we know it's zero. So we have some thinking about that. Uh, how can we reset this frame counter? And we who maybe, maybe its value is never stored in the non-volatile memory. So if we reboot the sensor, it resets to zero. So, so we want to reboot the sensor remotely, obviously. We don't want to go and uh, check the button. We want to do it remotely. So what we did is we flew the pan on its channel. So again, we broadcast a lot of frame. And the sensor restart looking up for a new pan, a new coordinator on every channel. And if they do not find any pan after a time, they will reboot. So we know how to reboot the sensor. So now we have to reboot the coordinator. So we use something the same way. We flood the pan, so the sensor cannot connect to the pan because we are flooding the channel, only one channel. And we use a fake pan, so basically uh, our tools set up on another channel. And we wait the sensor to connect. So we have to, to spoof the pan address, but we know it, so there is no challenge. And when the pan do not receive any answer for the sensor, is the pan reboot. So now we know how to reboot the pan coordinator. We know how to reboot the sensor. We know that when we say reboot, the frame counter is reset. So what we do is uh, we can get encrypted packet with the same nonce. We reboot the sensor. We record frame. So we know that the frame counter is starting to zero. We do that again and again and again. And we will need a lot of data, but it's uh, wireless. So we have plenty of time to record reset, record, and do, after that we do some crypto analysis and to guess the plain text. Obviously if you have some inside of uh, the plain text is easier. For example, if we know that we are talking about uh, sensor, uh, water sensor, we can think that the value will not change really fast. And it's the kind of thing that can help on the crypto analysis. So we are also able to do replay attacks since we can manage the frame counter, we can replay your packet with the same counter value. So we start attacking integrity, and it's quite interesting. But of course, what we want is crafting and injecting our frame. But we have, in fact, everything we need, because from the same nonce attack, we know the plain text. And if we know the plain text and the cipher text, of course, we can have the case stream. And with the case stream, and the value, and knowing the value of the counter, again, we can reset it. We can craft our packet, our encrypted packet, and send it with our fake sensor. And so we can send any value we want on the pan, and integrity is not uh, anymore. Maybe. Okay. So, uh, as Arnaud just uh, showed you, um, we, we started from scratch, we, we had no information because like I said previously the, the, the sensors were buried in pipes and, and uh, the, we, we, were, we could not have in, any information, at least the way we worked. 
And we ended up being able to craft uh, encrypted packet. So that means that we had all we needed to, to feed to our border router to be able to, uh, to, to, to route IPv6 frame from, uh, from six low point frames. And thus, we were at home. We could use Nmap. We can use uh, whatever we wanted. So we're not talking about the rest, because this is nothing new, actually, doing Nmap and, and stuff. But really, the, the hard part is to get from the we know nothing about the network to we are, we are able to craft uh, IPv, to, to, to forward IPv6 packets to the six lopan networks. The reason we were able to, to do so is because the, the, the supplier did four mi big mistakes that, we, that are very common. Uh, first, um, let me say that the usual way to work uh, on that on question aspect is to do, to find a GTAG or BDM or something to extract the firmware and from that firmware to extract the key. But since we were not able to, to do that, we had to work at the encryption level. So the, the, the mistakes made by the supplier was first to think that encryption protects integrity. Uh, if you don't have the key, you cannot forge packets. Uh, that is not true. Uh, integrity code, MIC or MAC, can are, exact, are there for, to protect integrity. Uh, encryption only protects confidentiality. Uh, and actually, in a sensor network, confidentiality is not that important. Uh, integrity and availability are the one, the one, the two aspects that are very important. One of the mistakes was to, um, to, to, to sorry, let me. I was sure to have them in the right order. Okay, uh, volatile, non-volatile memory. Uh, usually when you have counters to prevent replay attacks, uh, these counters are only kept in memory and they are never uh, stored in uh, non-volatile non -volatile memory. That means that if you are able to reboot a device, you reset the counters and you have replay attacks. And if, if you have not used uh, cryptography properly, you have both replay attacks and some nonce attack, and then you can have uh, malabita don't add us forge, forge uh, encrypted frame without having the key. Uh, and rebooting devices actually are not that hard because with sets on network, the main consideration is always availability. And rebooting is always the last resort when they don't understand why the coordinator does not receive any information why the sensors are not able to, to synchronize with the, the coordinator. Whenever something won't happen, they try many things, but at some point, the last resort is always to reboot. So if you play with the network, at some point, we force a reboot, and you will force a lot of things like association procedure, like resetting of the counters, and so on. So uh, obviously we didn't break the water pipes with us, <laughs> but we have a little demonstration here. So uh, we, sorry, what? So uh, remember, I said that uh, the deviation are possible, so so we, we set up uh, Arduinos, simple Arduinos, with the X, XB chip I told earlier that is not, uh, that is not, that has not, is not compliant with the standard. And uh, we set up the Arsene tool on, with the Skype radio and the USRP to do the SDR part. And uh, if you switch to the next slide, you can see that um, this is, I can do actually this with my computer right now. I don't know if I can plug the VGA cable. Too far. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have to, deep, uh, to move all that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Let's say if you want, if you have question, don't hesitate to come here, uh, and we will show you the demonstration. But basically, if you can see, I do ping, I do nmap, I do uh, telnet, and I'll do all this for my computer. I, I, in that computer has no idea. He's talking to uh, six local networks. The, firm, the border router with all the information provided by the scanner is doing the job, so I can pretty much do a standard penetration, test aid, standard penetration testing on this component without having to, uh, to take care of the 6 lopan and the 15.4 parts of the network. And that's it for the presentation. I thank you. If you have any questions...
And if you want to see the demo close up, please come. We have some time, I think, so you can see it.